Friends, good morning, and may the peace of Christ be with you today. A City Church is a historically rooted and spiritually diverse Christian community, and we're glad you're joining us today. If this is your first time with us and you'd like to get in touch, please feel free to check us out on the web at citychurchftl.com slash welcome or citychurchpb.com slash welcome. Before we begin, hear this call to worship from Psalm 124. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. Pray with me. Our Father in the heavens, we thank you that you are the one that we can call out to. We thank you for your son, Jesus, for his life, death, and resurrection. We ask that you would send your spirit among us this morning. Draw us into your presence. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together. Bye. 
As we gather together, we have an opportunity to confess together. And we're called into confession with these words from Hebrews 10, 19 through 22. Since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened up for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. We'll confess together, and then I will give you some time to confess silently. Forgive us, O Lord, for everything that spoils our home life, for the moodiness and irritability that makes us difficult to live with, for the insensitivity that makes us careless of the feelings of others, for the selfishness that makes life harder for others. Forgive us, O Lord, for everything that spoils our witness for you, that we so often deny with our lives what we say with our lips, for the difference between our creed and our conduct, our profession and our practice, for any examples that make it easier for people to criticize your church or for another to sin. When we think of ourselves and of the meanness and ugliness and weakness of our lives, we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Grant unto us a true penitence for our sins. Grant that at the foot of the cross we may find our burden rolled away. And so strengthen us by your Spirit that in the days to come we may live more nearly as we ought. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And now, Lord, we ask that you hear us as we confess the ways we've sinned against you and against one another. The good news of the gospel is this. If anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the perfect offering for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Our sermon text comes from Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then, with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, and pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the saints. Today, we're looking at the idea of spiritual warfare. And depending on your interaction with the church over the years, you might have heard a lot about spiritual warfare or maybe very little at all. It seems that no matter what culture you're a part of, there seems to be at least some fascination with the demonic, the spiritually demonic. While watching a Netflix series, Stranger Things, recently, I was reminded of the cultural phenomenon in the 1980s with the fantasy role-playing game Dungeons & Dragons. <laughs> I remember hearing so many people labeling the game demonic or satanic. The same thing happened with cartoon characters like the Smurfs and other cartoons. Many of the big hair glam bands were called satanic and some even adopted the title for shock effect. If it dressed in black, wore eye makeup and growled a lot, it was satanic. But you don't hear a lot about things being labeled satanic anymore. You might even roll your eyes at the idea of a personal evil called Satan or the devil. Even current Satanists would consider themselves unaffiliated humanists. But evil, 
That's another story. We make moral judgments all the time. We call things evil. We call people evil. In our current climate, the evil ideology is always on the other side of a political or maybe even racial or ethnic divide. But a personal devil, a personal Satan, nah, we'll pass on that. Many people, maybe you're one of those, you believe the idea of a personal evil is some kind of outdated fable. Well, in this letter to the Ephesians, St. Paul gets to the end of chapter six and he begins to talk about spiritual warfare. And he points to this personal evil. In Ephesians chapter six, verses 10 through 12, it says this, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in heavenly places. Paul makes a claim that there is a devil. The Bible talks about the devil as a supernatural personal force of tremendous evil and power. He is called the God of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Jesus teaches that there is a personal supernatural force, an evil supernatural personality called the devil. Jesus actually talked about the devil more than anyone. The Bible speaks of the source of personal good, God, and the source of personal evil, or Satan, or the devil. If you believe in a source of supernatural good, it would be a little inconsistent to not believe that there's a source of supernatural evil. One of the things that this letter to the Ephesians has shown us is that evil in the human heart is this multidimensional thing. We can't just reduce evil to simplistic terms and ignore that there's a source. Also, if you're a person who's skeptical of these ideas, consider it might be skepticism that comes from a narrow view of your own culture. I mean, it, it actually is mostly in white Western individualistic cultures that people have a hard time believing in a personal evil or devil. So if the Bible is right on this, then you won't be able to understand, let alone defeat the darkness in your own heart or bring the actual darkness of our city to light on your own. We can't just ignore really important nuances of evil and bootstrap our way through. There is flesh and blood evil that produces war and greed and racism and crime and poverty. And when we ignore what's behind it, well, we just see the fight as something between us and them. It's personal. But Paul says our battle is not ultimately between flesh and blood, but it's ultimately against a cosmic evil. It's at this point that if we believe this, we can fall into what C.S. Lewis calls in his introduction to the screw tape letters, the two errors. Essentially, Lewis says on the one hand, you can overestimate their strength. You can have an unhealthy interest in them and ascribe all evil to them or ascribe too much power to them. Or on the other hand, to disbelieve in them, to not believe in them at all. One is overbelief, one is underbelief. N.T. Wright puts it this way, some people dismiss the idea of the devil by thinking of a ridiculous little person with horns and hooves wearing red tights. They can't believe in a creature like that, so they decide they can't believe in the devil at all. Other people become so fascinated with the devil that they think of little else and suppose that every ordinary problem in life or difficulty in someone else's personality is due to devilish intervention. Lewis steers a wise path between these two extremes, and so should we. But perhaps for many, the danger may be more in ignoring the tempter rather than over-dramatizing him. Paul is trying to help us not commit the same errors. On one hand, he uses these words in verse 12 to show us that these are rulers, authorities, cosmic powers, I mean, heavy stuff. But on the other hand, he says, be strong in the Lord. Don't underestimate them, but don't overestimate that they can't be defeated. So what are the weapons of this cosmic evil? Well, the root word devil is actually diablos. It's the noun form of a verb that means to lie or slander. The enemy is called a liar throughout scripture. There are two main ways that he lies. He lies through temptation and he lies through accusation. So how are we tempted by the enemy? 
Well, there was a man named John White who wrote a book that illustrated how the devil works. He says, if you take a piano and you open the top and you sing a note into it, whatever string your voice is attuned to, that particular string will vibrate. It's the string that's attuned to your voice. You haven't touched it and yet it's vibrating to your voice. And that's what the devil does. The devil can't make a good person bad. He just takes the flawed, sinful tendencies in our own hearts and makes them worse. The devil plays on what already is in you. He aggravates what's already in you through lies. Earlier in Ephesians 4, verses 26 and 27, it says, be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. And Paul is affirming in the same idea that the way the devil works is through your natural sinful tendencies. The Bible insists again and again that the devil and your sin are bound up together. The way to deal with the devil is to deal with your sin. Ultimately, sin and unbelief are rooted in what we think or believe about God. When we're tempted at the root of what temptation is uh, to believe too little of God and too much of ourselves. Tim Chester says that there are four things that we tend to forget or diminish about God that leads to sin in our lives. He calls them the four Gs. That God is great, that God is good, that God is glorious, that God is gracious. So one of the first things that we see in the beginning of the Bible is the temptation to believe that God isn't good that in some way he's holding out on us. In Genesis chapter two, we see that God gives Adam and Eve everything they need for life and happiness. He tells them that every tree is good for food for them to eat. But he says, well, there's one tree though that's off limits. You can't eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And we see in Genesis three that Satan comes to Eve and he plays on her pride. He was asking her like, did God really say this? He twists God's words to tempt her to believe that God is holding out on her. And she would actually, if she would eat the fruit, then she would be her own God. Like she, she would know better. And so she did. And so did Adam. And it didn't lead them to more enlightenment, but it led them to disintegration and death. When the tempter convinces us that God isn't good, then we'll look to something or someone other than God for satisfaction. We'll try to find satisfaction in relationships or work or pleasure or approval of others. And it will be a never ending search for the kind of satisfaction that only comes because God is good. We tend to quickly forget God's goodness when we're tempted by some immediate pleasure. We think the pleasures of sin are immediate and the pleasures of God are far off and distant and we spend our lives restlessly chasing after one pleasure or another only to find they don't last. In the end, you will never find the happiness that you look for because you're always looking to something new to do for you what only God can do because God is good. Only God can give you lasting satisfaction. Another way that we're tempted is to believe that God isn't great. To say that God is great means that God is sovereign. He's almighty over all things. God created everything. Jesus sustains everything by the power of his word. There's nothing that's beyond God's ability to do. God works all things according to the counsel of his will. God sustains and rules all. Jesus has control over the natural world, over every spiritual power, over sickness and death. God uses control for our good, our salvation, our transformation, our restoration. And we tend to quickly forget God's greatness and sovereignty when things don't go our way. How do we respond when that happens? Well, often we respond by trying to be in control ourselves. When our computer crashes or when we get stuck in traffic or when kids don't obey or when the bank account's low, what do we do? Well, we scramble to fix it. We see this in nearly every area of our lives, our time, career, finances, relationships, other people's actions, other people's impressions of us. This often produces worry and busyness, obsession, frustration, stress, controlling and manipulating. It leads us to a lack of gentleness and pride and guilt. Pride when things go our way or guilt when they don't. 
A third way that we're tempted is to believe that God isn't glorious. And what that means is that God is the most impressive and important being out there. He should be the weightiest in his terms of influence in our lives. As the author of life, as the source of love, as the creative genius behind the wonders and marvels of everything that exists, as the giver of good gifts, as our good father, as our savior, who else is worthy of adoration and praise? Who else should we seek to please? Only he is worthy of living our lives for. He alone is glorious, and yet we are tempted to quickly forget God's glory when we're threatened by other people. We conform our thoughts and actions to those whose wrath we actually fear and whose approval and affections we desire. The Bible calls this the fear of people. When we fear others, we're susceptible to peer pressure, to needing something from a spouse or a friend, a concern with self-esteem, being overcommitted because we can't say no. Maybe we have a fear of being exposed. We tell small lies to make ourselves look good. People make us jealous or angry or depressed or anxious. Often we avoid other people or compare ourselves with others. And a fourth way that we are tempted is to believe that God isn't gracious. When Satan tempts us in this area, it often involves his other trick. There's temptation, but there's also accusation. Satan is great at accusing. He wants us to believe that we are beyond the reach of God's love and grace. See, the bad news and good news of the gospel is this. The bad news first is that our sin, which is rebellion against God, because of it, we deserve death from God. We deserve judgment because God is a God of justice. And yet Jesus has not given us what we deserve. Rather, he's given us what we do not deserve. He's given us his life, his innocence, his standing as a perfect son before the Father. This doesn't change based off our moral achievements or failures. We are no more loved when we succeed as when we fail. We are no less loved when we fail as when we succeed. Our relationship and our future with God is secure, not on our work, not based on our work, but based on his work. We are saved by grace, and yet we tend to quickly forget God's grace when we've failed or when others suggest we have. How do we then respond? We often wanna justify ourselves. We wanna be right. We want only affirmation. We want people to think that we're doing great, that we're competent, successful, and generally good people. We don't always view ourselves this way, but it comes to the surface when we have an argument or someone questions one of our decisions. Suddenly walls go up, guns come out. It's time to defend ourselves or prove our worth. We spend time replaying that argument over and over again, imagining what we could have done to get the upper hand. We often feel burdened, hard on ourselves. We set high standards for us and others. We're slow to forgive or we don't forgive at all. We're restless and angry. We do things out of joyless duty and anxious performance, and we're constantly comparing ourselves to others. Behind most of our temptation is the temptation to have a view of ourselves that's too high and a view of God that's too low, to believe that he isn't good, great, glorious, and gracious. Behind the enemy's accusations, he's trying to get us to think too low of ourselves and to believe that God couldn't possibly love us. Do you recognize any of these things in your life? Do you see how the enemy is fighting you? So what do you need? What resources? How do we fight this? Well, in verses 13 through 18, it says this. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the, on the evil day and having done all to stand firm, stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. Our defense against all the schemes of the enemy is what Paul calls the armor of God. This isn't a new section of the letter where he's giving a new way to live the way God intended, but he's using an illustration to point back to what he was saying at the beginning of this letter. 
Remember, he was writing to Christians, and in Ephesians chapter three, he's praying for them. And this is part of his prayer. He says, I pray that according to the riches of the glory, of his glory, that he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit, through your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. His prayer is that God would take what is objectively true about the gospel and press it into your heart. And then in Ephesians 6, he's using this metaphor for them to do the same thing. Tim Keller puts it this way. To put on the armor of God means to take the things that are objectively true to you as a Christian, the privileges and positions of being a Christian, to take what is externally and objectively true and so drill it into your heart that without having to tell yourself, you instinctively, reflexively respond as a loved person, as an accepted person, as a safe person. In other words, putting on the armor of God is taking what is true of you, the privileges in the gospel, and putting them into your heart and creating new habits of the heart, new reflexes, new dispositions of the soul. See, the armor is the gospel. If you believe the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to live the life that you should have lived before God and didn't, and that Jesus died the death that you deserved on the cross, that he was bearing your sin and guilt and shame and the penalty for your sin as your substitute, so that when you believe him, all of your sin was credited to him and all of his righteousness is credited to you. And when that happens, there's so much freedom in admitting that my sin was so big that Jesus had to die, but that I am so loved that he was willing to die. See, the main tools of the enemy are temptation and accusation. He wants you to be filled with pride or filled with despair. He wants you to be so crushed by your guilt or have no guilt at all. He wants you to attempt to be your own God through your own effort. He wants you to believe that God is not good, great, glorious, and gracious. To put on the gospel is to arm yourself with these truths that God is good, great, glorious, and gracious. And then in Christ, he's done everything necessary to restore us perfectly. Notice as Paul is talking about the armor, he's saying things like having done all or having put on. These are actions that are completed in the past. These are things that have to be done before the battle starts. In our spiritual lives, we go through seasons of spiritual warfare. And when the battle with the enemy is real, That's when we need the armor. So in the metaphor, it tells us that the time we need to be prepared, well, that's before the battle. Think about this. When do we normally really get into prayer and seeking God? It's usually in the middle of the crisis, in the middle of the battle. We're then doing damage control. We're trying to fortify in the middle of the attack. If if things are going well in your life, you're probably forgetting about the armor. You're probably forgetting about how much you need it. The reality is the fortification of your heart takes time. It's not just an occasional inspirational Bible verse or an occasional prayer or or a weekly church gathering. It's daily immersion in the truth of God and what he has done for us in Jesus, which as we've said many times before, it includes a community of faith. So what's significant about the way that the armor is described here? Well, notice that each piece is described as an aspect of how the gospel protects and defends. The belt of truth, well, that's something that they would wear underneath that would hold everything else together. The foundational aspect of God being consistently faithful and true is what then gives support to all the other pieces. The breastplate of righteousness and the helmet of salvation, it guards the heart and the head. You can take shots to other parts of the body, but when flaming arrows hit your heart and your head, these are fundamental. This is where the gospel matters most. The shield of faith, it's necessary to use when the arrows are coming at you. It's faith that believes and declares that you don't have a righteousness of your own, but you receive the righteousness counted to you by God. When the enemy attacks through temptation and accusation, this shield is working overtime. The shoes of peace move with the gospel into every aspect of life. To believe the gospel internally is to live the gospel out externally. 
The gospel doesn't just protect, but it propels us out of ourselves in the ways of peace. And then we're talking about the word and prayer. These are vital to how we are building up this gospel in our lives. And lastly, notice that because the armor is about the gospel, then it means an end to having to invent our own defenses. This is a defense that is given to us and it is an end to our own defenses. What a relief, right? I don't have to be defensive because I have a defense that's better than any I could have invented. This defense reminds us that the whole story of the gospel is about a God who defends and fights for us. Throughout the Bible, the battle always belongs to God. He's described in the Psalms as our shield, defender, our fortress. This armor in Ephesians 6 is pointing to that ultimate reality. Ultimately, Jesus came to fight the greatest enemy and to bear our judgment so that someday he will come and defeat evil without ending us. That's the battle. That's the warfare that we're participating in. Put on the armor of God, the gospel, so that you will be able to stand on that day. Let's pray. God, thank you for this good gospel, this good word to us that Jesus was everything for us we could not be. And that he has counted to us by faith his righteousness, forgiveness, the love of God. We are accepted, restored sons and daughters because of the work of Jesus. Would you apply this to us? And God, would you fortify our souls so that when the temptation comes, so that when the accusation comes, that we would be able to stand. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. As we've heard this gospel together, let's take a minute and affirm our faith together. Let's affirm our faith together with these words from Ephesians 3. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God, the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Hey, we wanna thank you for joining us in worship this morning online with us. I hope that you enjoyed your time with us. If you're new to the City Church community, uh, we wanna invite you to fill out a Connect card online. You can do it digitally uh, on our website. We would love to stay in touch with you and follow up if there's anything we can do for you. Anyways, we can pray for you. Any needs you have that we can meet, we want to be there for you. If you want to connect throughout the week online with us at City Church, you're welcome to and we invite you to. Tuesday mornings, we're praying together. Wednesday evenings, we're having Wednesday night church together, a liturgy of community, of prayer, and of scripture. And so join us for that. And if you call City Church your home, We do want to give you, before we leave, just an opportunity to give back a portion of which God has given you. Uh, You'll see a link there uh, for for the online uh, offering options. Uh, We really appreciate your gifts to make the City Church community thrive and flourish in our city. And so with that, I want to offer us this good word, this benediction. Today it's from Hebrews chapter 13. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, equip you with everything good to do his will, working in us what is pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's go in peace.